Have you ever been so mad at something that you decided you wanted to kill it? Has that thing ever been the ocean? If you answered yes to both of these questions, then you have a lot in common with the daughter of Yan Di, China's flame emperor. This week, we look at what I believe is one of the most important Chinese myths, and its genuinely surprising moral implications. Join me, Jer Christie, as I explore the hidden legends that shape the world on The Mythographist, Myths of Mainland China. A note before we get into the story, though. The name of Yandi's daughter is Nuwa, which sounds the same to English-speaking ears as the goddess Nuwa, and this confused me to no end for a while. But these two characters are not the same, they never have been, and this is obvious for native Chinese speakers. The first syllable, Nu, is the same in both names. It means woman or female. But the second written characters, although they're both pronounced Wa, are distinct from each other. The goddess's Wa means creator deity, while the emperor's daughter's Wa means child, particularly a younger child. And so, without further ado, Jingwei and the Sea. Long, long ago, in the lands by the western mountains, lived Yan Di, the Flame Emperor. He was conceived when his mother touched a dragon, and the dragon's spirit was in him from the day of his birth until the day he died. A fierce warrior and a bold leader he was, and all people now regard him as one of the forefathers of the land. Now, Yan Di has a child, his pride and joy, a little girl whose name is Nuwa. More than anything, Nuwa loves the sea. She plays on its shores, she lies on its beaches, she swims in its waves and dries in its winds. She runs with the little birds that flee the crashing breakers, she digs after the burrowing shells and spindly crabs that hide from passing shadows. But there comes a day when she grows careless. Perhaps the current is stronger than she realizes, or perhaps she is more tired than she knows, perhaps her protectors lose sight of her in her playful mischief, or perhaps a spirit of the sea is spiteful towards her for an unknown wrong. Whatever the reason, poor Nuwa is pulled beneath the waves, and there she drowns. Her father, Yan Di, is sad beyond all consolation when he learns of her death. He takes out his boat and rows up and down the coast, hoping to find some trace of his dear daughter. But, though he searches far and wide for her body, he does not find it. But his search is not completely in vain, for finally he does find something. It is a soft light, just below the face of the sea, and when he nears it, it draws near to him and follows him to shore. Yan Di keeps it, for he knows it is his daughter's soul, and he seeks to learn from every sage and text what he can do for her. He need not worry, though, for when the time is right, Nuwa's soul transforms of its own accord. It sprouts wings and a white beak. It grows black feathers and red feet, and finally it takes to the air in flight a girl reborn into a bird. As she flies, she cries a cry that sounds like Jing Wei, and it is from that cry that this new bird's name comes. Jing Wei is a seabird, but she has not forgotten her past, nor the coldness with which the sea took her life. And so, though as a girl she loved the waters, now she hates them. And Jingwei vows to the sea, Since you stole my life away, I will fill you up with sticks and rocks until you cease to be. The sea laughs at her, and its waves crash mirthfully on the rocks. Foolish girl, it says, it will be ten thousand years and ten thousand more, and still you will not be able to fill me up. But Jingwei will not be deterred. No matter if it takes a hundred thousand years, or a million more, O oh sea, still I will have my revenge on you. Jingwei takes for her husband another bird of coastal lands, a sea swallow, and together they make their home on the mountain called Fajiu in the north. 
The children can be seen even to this day. The males resemble their father, but the females take after their mother. And, even today, the Jingwei bird carries pebbles and twigs in its mouth and drops them into the ocean, for she remembers her past. Still she bears her grudge against the sea, and all her sons and daughters follow her. And some day, in the distant future, when all the seas are dry, we shall know that Jingwei is triumphant in the end, because she persists. So what can we learn from Jingwei? When you are faced with a task that seems as impossible as filling up the sea with tiny stones, do not give up. Be tenacious, be courageous, and though it takes a million years, or a million more, perhaps you will succeed. When I heard this story, I assumed that it took place near the ocean. China has a lot of coastline, and in my mind's eye, I think I saw islands in the distance. However, Yandi's tribe historically likely lived around modern Shanxi province, which is nowhere close to the coast, so the body of water involved was probably a fairly large lake or river, of which there are plenty in central China. Another theory I've heard is that the boundaries of the ocean have changed since the ancient times in which this story happened. It's a bit far-fetched, but is associated with the flood myths that we'll talk about in a few weeks. Jingwei is one of the most well-known folktales in China. It's even got its own four-character idiom about persisting in the impossible, despite its impossibility. And if you're a regular listener, and this is feeling maybe a little bit familiar, there's a good reason for that. It shares a lot of parallels with the story of Kuafu chasing the sun. To me, these same ideas existing in two very popular stories is an indication that something important is going on. So I want to take a closer look at these ideas and their significance in modern Chinese culture. The stories we as humans tell both represent and reinforce our worldview. This is true on all levels, from individual to societal and everywhere in between. We like, gravitate towards, repeat stories for any number of reasons. We like the characters, whether they're real or fictional, we're surprised by the events, or maybe they're exactly what we're expecting. Whatever the case, the stories that we like, and repeat, help us find community. When I was a kid, I really loved Star Wars, and most of my best friends also loved Star Wars, because it was a story that we shared. Having a shared story is a way to have common assumptions, certain things you don't have to think about anymore. When my friends and I talked about Star Wars, we didn't have to start every conversation with, it's in space, space is cool, there are humans and aliens, aliens are pretty cool, but it's not in our universe, there's space magic, uh, space magic is cool, some of the people who use the space magic are good, but some are bad. We already had those tenets in place, and it gave us shared context that could lead us in different directions. On a societal level, there are so many kinds of stories that we share, and that help define both our individual identities and our group associations. And again, our shared context helps us connect. Some familiar examples, the royal family in the UK, or George Washington in the US, Jesus to Christians, and Muhammad to Muslims. We know these stories, we know our own, and importantly, we also know those belonging to others and we see them as lines of demarcation, something that differentiates us from them. There's a lot of factors that make this whole thing very messy, but one place where it gets extra tricky is when we can't recognize the stories that define us, or when we don't know the stories that define them. We know that they are different from us, but maybe we haven't thought about our own stories, and we haven't heard theirs. More likely, we don't even realize that our stories aren't the same as theirs. All we see is the surface differences, things like food and language and skin color and which side of the road we drive on, which are differences, of course, but they're not the ones that need to be learned about and thought about and considered. Here's a story for you. Sometime around 2016, I was teaching a class of about 30 university students in China. We were doing an activity and one group had too many papers and other groups didn't have any. So I had one student collect the extra papers from their group and distribute them to the other groups that didn't have any. 
and I said something along the lines of, You're Robin Hood. And my entire class looked at me blankly. So I said, Oh, you don't know Robin Hood. And a few of them said, Yes, teacher, we do know Robin Hood, but what does he have to do with anything? And I said, Robin Hood's thing was that he stole from the rich and he gave to the poor. And then they got it. Now, if I'd been in a Western classroom, everyone would have understood that reference. But even familiarity with the character, for my Chinese students, didn't give him the same significance. Even though they'd heard the story, they hadn't heard what it meant to us. That told me two things. First, that there are a lot of stories that are important to me, that everyone in my culture knows and understands, that my Chinese students and friends didn't know that they didn't know. And second, that they must have important stories that I'm completely ignorant of. And that, of course, is what started me researching Chinese mythology. I found a lot of very interesting stories that, as predicted, I had no idea even existed, hence this podcast. But as I learned the stories, I began to understand the culture around me better. The stories were like pictures of ideas and beliefs, and those beliefs were what led to the actions and interactions and reactions that played out in everyday life. So, all that to say, keep in mind that this is one of the truly foundational stories in China. Everybody knows it, everybody knows the idiom, and people don't think about whether or not it happened. Whether Jingwei was real, or the daughter of the emperor, or really turned into a bird, or whatever. It's part of the mytho-historical record, sure, and something like it could have happened. But what people do believe is the ideas at the core of this story. The theme in Jingwei, just like in Kwafu, is persisting in the impossible in spite of its impossibility. And I say theme instead of moral, because it's not a moral. It's not passing moral judgment on the action, it's not telling you what to do or what not to do. Like the Kwafu idiom, it can be used to praise or to mock. It's just acknowledging that it's a possibility to keep doing something, even when you know full well that it's futile and that that choice in itself is amoral. It's not necessarily good or bad to do that, it's just a thing you can do. I don't think it's just me who finds it instinctive to look to stories for guidance. I want a story to tell me whether something is right or wrong, or at least a good or bad decision in a given context. But again and again in Chinese mythology, the stories refuse to be moralized. They just say, here's an option. I think that this rejection of moralization is closely tied to what we think of as Zen philosophy, embracing that mutually contradictory things can both be true. It's stepping back from immediate right and wrong to consider facts strictly as facts without passing judgment on them. And the fact that's presented here in the Jingwei story is, you can do something even if you know it won't have results. For folks in the West, especially in the business realm, that's almost taboo. Doing something even though you know it won't have results. Even with hobbies, we often feel pressure to do something with them, to be more productive in our time, and to find a new hobby if this one isn't productive enough. And I'm definitely not saying that this attitude is absent from Chinese culture, because it's absolutely there too. But again, this very important story presents the option. Paradoxically, making an action's results amoral might actually free you to make a more moral choice. What if you believe a certain course of action is the right thing to do, but you know it won't have results? Well, if results aren't driving your decision-making process, I'll leave you to think about that. So, is it a good idea to spend your time and energy on something that you know won't pay off? Instead of immediately answering yes or no, try incorporating this secret third option into your list of responses. It is intrinsically neither good nor bad. It's simply a thing you can choose to do. Thanks for listening. This episode of The Mythographist was written, narrated, and produced by me, Jer Christie, with research by myself and Elena Tung, and music by Xiaoqing Lunali. If you liked this episode, stick around because there's lots more where this came from. 
subscribe to get notified automatically when The Mythographist updates, and be sure to check out the rest of the episodes on your favorite podcast platform or on YouTube. Finally, if there's a story that you grew up with that has shaped the way you see the world, I'd love to hear it. I hope that this episode in particular has convinced you that the more of each other's stories we hear, the more we'll understand each other, because we can't learn if we don't listen. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you next time on The Mythographist.